We have to shift from this mainframe mentality of healthcare to a personal model of healthcare. We are obsessed with this way of thinking. When Intel does surveys all around the world and we say quick response, healthcare, the first word that comes up is doctor, the second that comes up is hospital, and the third is illness or sickness, right? It is, we are wired in our imagination to think about healthcare and healthcare innovation as something that goes into that place. Our entire health reform discussion right now, health IT, when we talk to it with policymakers, equals how are we going to get doctors using electronic medical records in the mainframe? We're not thinking about how do we shift from the mainframe to the home. And the problem with this is the way we conceive healthcare, right? This is a very reactive, crisis driven system. We're doing 15 minute exams with patients, it's population based. We collect a bunch of biological information in this artificial setting and we fix them up like Humpty Dumpty all over again and send them home and hope, we might hand them a brochure, maybe an interactive website, that they do as asked and don't come back into the mainframe. And the problem is we can't afford it today, folks. We can't afford mainframe healthcare today to include the uninsured, and now we want to do a double-double of the age wave coming through. Business as usual in healthcare is broken, and we've got to do something different. We've got to focus on the home. We've got to focus on a personal healthcare paradigm that moves care to the home. How do we be more proactive, prevention-driven, how do we collect vital signs and other kinds of information 24 by 7? How do we get a personal baseline about what's going to work for you? How do we collect not just biological data, but behavioral data, psychological data, relational data, in and on and around the home? And how do we drive compliance to be a customized care plan that uses all this great technology that's around us to change our behavior? That's what we need to do for a personal health model. I want to give you a couple of examples. This is Mimi from one of our studies. In her 90s, had to move out of her home because her family was worried about falls. Raise your hand if you had a serious fall in your household or any of your loved ones, your parents, or so forth. Right? Classic. Hip fracture often leads to institutionalization of a senior. This is what was happening to Mimi, or the family was worried about it, moved her out of her own home into an assisted living facility. She tripped over her oxygen tank. Many people in this generation won't press the button even if they have an alert call system because they don't want to bother anybody even though they've been paying $30 a month. Boomers will press the button, trust me. They're going to be pressing that button nonstop, <laughs> right? Mimi got, uh, broke her pelvis, lay all night, all morning. Finally, somebody came in and found her, sent her to the hospital. They fixed her back up. She was never going to be able to move back into the assisted living. They put her into the nursing home unit. First night in the nursing home unit where she had been in the same assisted living facility, moved her from one bed to another, kind of threw her, rebroke her pelvis, sent her back to the hospital that she had just come from. No one read the chart, put her on Tylenol, which she's allergic to, broke out, got bed sores, basically had heart problems, and died from the fall and the complications and the errors that were there. Now, the most frightening thing about this is, this is my wife's Grandmother. Now, I'm Eric Dishman. I speak English. I work for Intel. I make a good salary. Uh, I'm smart about falls and fall-related injuries. It's an area of research that I work on. I have access to senators and CEOs. I can't stop this from happening. What happens if you don't have money, don't speak English, or don't have the kind of access to deal with these kinds of problems that inevitably occur? How do we actually prevent the vast majority of falls from ever occurring in the first place? Let me give you a quick example of work that we're doing to try to do exactly that. I've been wearing a little technology that we call Shimmer. It's a research platform. It has accelerometry. You can plug in a three-lead ECG. There's all kinds of sort of plug-and-play kind of Legos that you can do to capture in the wild, in the real world, things like trimmer, gait, stride length, and those kinds of things. The problem is our understanding of falls today, like Mimi, is get a survey in the mail three months after you fell from the state saying, what were you doing when you fell? That's sort of the state of the art. But with something like Shimmer, or we have something called the magic carpet, embedded sensors in carpet, or camera-based systems that we've borrowed from sports medicine, we're starting for the first time in those 600 elderly households to collect actual kinematic motion data to understand what are the subtle changes that are occurring that can show us that mom has become risk at falls. And most often we can do two interventions. Fix the meds mix. I'm a qualitative researcher, but when I look at these data streams coming in from these homes, I can look at the data and tell you the day that some doctor prescribed them something that nobody else knew that they were on because we see the changes in their patterns in the household, right? 
These discoveries of behavioral markers and behavioral changes are game changing and like the discovery of the microscope because we're collecting data streams that we've actually never done before. This is an example in our Trill Clinic in Ireland of uh, actually what you're seeing is she's looking at data in this picture from the magic carpet. So we have a little carpet that you can look at your amount of postural sway and look at the changes in your postural sway over many months. Here's what some of this data might look like. This is actually sensor firings. Uh, these are two different subjects in our study. It's about uh, a year's worth of data. The color represents different rooms they are in the house. This person on the left is living in their own home. This person on the right is actually living in an assisted living facility. I know this because look at how punctuated mealtime is when they're no longer in their particular rooms here, right? Now, this doesn't mean that much to you, but when we look at these cycles of data over a longer period of time, and we're looking at everything from motion around different rooms in the house to sort of micro motions that Shimmer picks up about gait and stride length, these streams of data are starting to tell us things about behavioral patterns that we've never understood before. And you can go to orchitect.org. It has nothing to do with whales. It's the Oregon Center for Aging and Technology to see more about that. The problem is Intel is still one of the largest funders in the world of independent living technology research. I'm not bragging about how much we fund. It's how little anyone else actually pays attention to aging and funds innovation on aging, chronic disease management, and independent living in the home. So my mantra here, my fourth slogan is 10,000 households are bust. We need to drive a national, if not international, Framingham type heart study of independent living technologies where we have 10,000 elderly connected house households with broadband, full medical characterization, and a platform by which we can start to experiment and turn these from 20 household anecdotal studies that the universities fund to large clinical trials that prove out the value of these technologies. So 10,000 households are bust. These are just some of the households that we've done in the Intel studies. My fifth and final phrase, I have tried for two years, and there were moments where we were quite close, to make this healthcare reform bill be about reform from something and to something, from a mainframe model to a personal health model or to mean something more than just a debate about the public option and how we're going to finance. It doesn't matter how we finance healthcare. We're going to figure something out for the next 10 years and try it. No matter who pays for it, we better start doing care in a fundamentally different way and treating the home and the patient and the family member and the caregivers as part of these coordinated care teams and using disruptive technologies that are already here to do care in some pretty fundamental, pretty fundamental different ways. The president needs to stand up and say, at the end of healthcare reform debate, our goal as a country is to move 50% of care out of institutions, clinics, hospitals, and nursing homes to the home in 10 years. It's achievable. We should do it economically. We should do it morally. And we should do it for quality of life. But there's no goal within all this health reform. It's just a mess today. So, you know, that's my last message to you. How do we set a going to the moon goal of dealing with the Y2K plus 10 problem that's coming? It's not that innovation and technology is going to be the magic pill that cures all, but it's going to be part of the solution. And if we don't create a personal health movement, something that we're all aiming towards in reform, then we're going to move nowhere. So I hope you'll turn this conference into that kind of movement forward. Thanks very much.